it's exciting. All right, now that we're recording, uh, we'll start this party. So welcome everybody. This is third Tuesday of every month, right? And, uh, many of you have been going along for this party here for the last five months. Uh, what we try to do is focus on different promos, very specific promo standards education that you know is members only. I think we've done two open sessions and those are done for the year. Uh, those are the more generic getting started, you know, how to become a member, all that fun stuff. But really right now, what we're going to focus on for the remainder of the year is dissecting specific topics, dissecting specific, what we see is the things that people struggle with in promo standards. Some of the, you know, some, some are more higher level technical, some are more just implementation strategies. So you'll see it as we progress, as we go through. So, uh, like I said, hopefully we go about 45 minutes today. Uh, keep pumping all of your questions in the Q&A. That's, uh, I know Steve will get to a lot of them if you can. Anybody else who wants to chime in, uh, I'll rip through here on the session when we're done as we're wrapping up and I'll attempt to address any questions. And if, the good thing is, if there's any that we can't answer right away, we're gonna put that all in Slack and make sure we can uh, control it there. So I'm John Norris. I am on the Promo Standards Membership Marketing Education Committee. Uh, I head up our education work group. So uh, Ashley from Facilis is our chair over there. And one of the groups that she has spun up and decided to focus on this year is education. So here we are. Um, it's our Promo Standards U session for the month. So real quick, I think it's important that if you've been to any Promo Standards presentation that anybody's done, we always hit on this, right? Promo Standards is a nonprofit. We're 501c6. But most importantly, we collaborate to create industry-leading open standards that enable industry participants to improve customer experience, reduce transactional friction, and effectively execute their digital strategy. I think one of the things we've been hammering on, especially in the last four or five months, is the fact that we are open standards. It's a very collaborative process. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, the Standards Committee joined in a two and a half day, you know, session in Tampa where they hammered out future standards, went through existing standards, and we used feedback from the community that we've been collecting for the last 12, 18, 24 months, and that's how we get into that iterative design process. So if you have, if you are implementing things and it's just something comes up, speak up, get that into the right channels in Slack. There's a whole host of channels there too. There's, you know, the standards committee has a channel, but there's, you know, uh, technical implementation channels. Uh, we'll link to all those in the general channel when we're done here. But the general thing is stay active in Slack. It's the easiest way to find somebody to get you the right answers in the quickest amount of time. And if you can't get anything there, hit up Jessica. Jessica's our admin. She's the one who uh, organizes all this chaos. Uh, so always hit her up, admin at promocenters.org. <clears throat> um, sorry, everybody's going to get five minutes of commercials because that's how we are. Uh, one of the things that Promo Standards has been focusing on the last three months is this campaign we call We Standardize on Promo Standards. We're up to over 80 companies in the industry. If you look at the subset of companies that are on the right, uh, it's pretty significant players in the industry. But what it is, these are the companies who have publicly come out and said that Promo Standards, Open Standards are our preferred integration method for promotional products industry. So if you haven't signed on to this yet, Jessica's going to throw the link into the chat. Um, I am going to puke these QR codes up along the way as we go. Just, you can always hit those up. Uh, they'll link you directly to the We Standardize on Promo Standards page. Our goal is to keep growing this movement as big as we can in terms of public support. So like I said, we're at 80. If we can get to 100 in the next week, then we're gonna shout this thing from the rooftops. So get on board, it's a good cause. Uh, most importantly, not most importantly, second most importantly to this education session today is Promo Standards is currently in the middle of registration for our technology summit and hackathon. So it is the first week in October in Tampa, sunny Tampa, Florida. I was there two weeks ago. This location is awesome. It's right on the water. It's a five minute walk from some really hopping scenes in Tampa. Uh, we're excited. I think, you know, you, <clears throat> there's a whole page that Jessica's going to link to that has all the information on it. We're currently crafting an agenda that is very specific. There's going to be the 
you know, multiple tracks of education. So if you're like, I don't want to go to an all public promo standards education session, that's great. We're going to have those courses, that education for business leaders, technology leaders, but we're also going to have that very promo standards heavy track. So you know, we're going to hit both sides of the education spectrum. We're also going to have the industry's first industry-wide hackathon that's going to kick the event off. If you have your tech peeps, if you have people who just want to participate in an all around um, great collaborative event focused on, you know, how we can utilize promo standards to create really awesome things. That's going to be that event. Those details of the specifics for the hackathon are going to be coming out about the next week here. So uh, keep an eye out for that. We'll uh, definitely make that known. So <clears throat> hit that up. Uh, you're going to want to, oops. So one thing, since you are all uh, dedicated promo standards, education people, uh, and since you're going to sit and listen to me talk for 45 minutes, uh, we created the, <clears throat> if you were sitting here right now and you're like, oh dang, I still need to register for the technology summit. Uh, the first person to register uh, can use this promo code right now. It's only good for the next I don't know, 10 hours. Today only is a promo code. Hit that in before you go to the checkout. There's a promo code right after you add the tickets to your um, checkout. Save yourself 10%. Once first person, so if you're sitting there, and you're like, Hey, I got three minutes to do this, you want to save yourself 100 bucks or so, hit that up, uh, it'd be a good time. So, having said that, uh, we do plan on the collaborative expert, uh, efforts in Tampa. We're going to make sure that we get the education, the collaboration. We're also gonna make sure we have a little bit of fun. I think it's important that this community, I think, does its best work when we're all, um, you know, collaborating and at the same time having fun. The purchase order standard that we are about to go through was literally crafted in a bar at about 10 o'clock at night watching a hockey game. So these things get done in odd places. So we'll make sure we're gonna have a little fun along the way. All right, let's get to the topic at hand here. Uh, <laughs> I think there's a lot of chatter in the industry in the last four months over the concept of uh, I want to do a configured purchase order. I want to do a simple purchase order. Well, what's the con what constitutes a simple purchase order versus a configured purchase order? And what's the gray area? So we want to iron out some of that gray area today, really show the differences between what we as promo standards would consider simple versus configured. I think there's a pretty clear line once you break the standard down into what is configured versus what is simple. Now, from a very technical, you know, right out of the documentation for the purchase order, I think it gets, you know, very clearly defined here, but then the interpretation is kind of what we're going to get into. So at the essence of the, the problem or the, you know, discussion here is promo center supports four order types, right? There's blank and there's sam sample, which you know, in our world is random samples, pre-decorated goods that are ready to ship at any moment's notice. There's simple, which is kind of what we're here to talk about, or most importantly, the configured side. So you can obviously read the descriptions there. I think a, a lot of the gray area is when does a blank order become a simple, when does a blank PO become a simple PO, and when does that become a configured PO? I would say, you know, half the industry today is apparel, undecorated goods, right, in terms of sales volume. So if you're just looking to get by and skip the decoration and skip some of the complexities, you could probably get a lot of bang for your buck with the blank and simple style POs, right? So, you know, the Alphas, the Sandmars, the SNSs of the world are all active Promo Standards members and they're all actively onboarding blank goods. So I'll briefly touch on those elements, but what we want to really hone on towards the end here is this concept of configured purchase orders. So when you break down the purchase order, I'm gonna get into some pretty granular details here. So. Um, if you're not, if you're thinking this is way too uh, big picture right now, just, you know, we're going to, you know, iron out every single piece here. So when you break down the purchase order standard, there's really five large elements, right? There's the PO, which is the header, right? If you think of it as your standard purchase order, it's all the header information. Uh, and then the header information, which is all your ship to bill to, you know, any of those auxiliary details are kind of important for getting paid. Uh, there's line items, right? A purchase order, you're ordering something. What are those things? Uh, so this is very, I would say, standard 
both within our industry and outside the industry, right? If anytime you're ordering something, you have some header information, some line items. That's where we are going to really hone in on calling that a simple purchase order, right? You have to have some header information and you have to have some line item details. Now, what makes our industry unique which is you know, why Promo Standards has a open standard dedicated to our industries, because what we do is mostly complicated on the configured side. So there are five, three elements that come off of the purchase order underneath that basic, what you would call boilerplate PO information. And that's our configuration, which we're gonna dive into. Uh, configuration is you know how we're decorating it, the locations, and then the concept is, hey, I want you to do this stuff to this purchase order on these locations and oh, by the way, take this art file, follow these instructions and do something to it. So that's kind of the frame of mind to be in right now, what we're going to talk about the difference between simple and configured. <clears throat> Just in text form, for those of you who are going to follow along and watch this in your leisure afterwards, you know, the biggest definition difference between simple and configured is essentially configured purchase orders use PPC. If you're new to promo standards, PPC is product price and configuration. In order, a simple purchase order, and I'll use Starline as an example <clears throat> where I work. If you send us a simple purchase order, I'm going to get 50% of that information automatically entered, and then I have to kick it out to a human. You send me a configured purchase order using product price and configuration data, the first person who sees that is my art team. Right, it skips customer service, skips order entry, and just goes right into the system. How does that happen? Obviously, we're going to dive into it's because it's using PPC. So, as back to the core definition, when you saw the initial slide I put up there, promo standards, once when you're using a configured style purchase order, we want you to use the PPC service. Now, Oddly enough, next month's education session is how to hack and get around the PPC service and use configured purchase orders using product data 2.0. So we're gonna have that discussion next week. So ignore that my next month's education session is exactly opposite of what I just said. But the essence of the difference is that whole difference between PPC and not. So I think what we'll find, and you'll, I'll touch on this towards we get to the end, many people start their journey thinking I'm gonna do simple POs. And then they get through the journey and be like, well, I'm 90% of the way there. I already had to do quasi configured POs because I had to get down to art level. I had to dig, dig into the decoration level. And I had to send some charges over. Well, at that point, you're just a few steps away from the concept of a fully configured purchase order. But I, the simple concept has a lot of relevant information. And some of this is opinion. So take it where it's worth. I think the biggest case, use case today, obviously for a simple PO is ordering blank and undecorated goods. I would say you, well, we call it simple. My definition of simple is just simple versus configured. Right now, obviously you would use the order type blank when sending over blank undecorated goods. But look, like I said, half the industry is, that's where that's going. So by all means, hit that up. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I process all exact repeat orders um, as simple, right? If it's an exact repeat, I don't necessarily need to have all the artwork information, all the other information, because I already have all of that. And most things that change with the exact repeats would be quantity and any header information, obviously ship dates, things like that change. So <clears throat> there is a very real use case for repeat orders being processed as simple because I've already entered the order, I've already processed the order, I know the configuration, you're referring to that configuration already, I don't need to go back through and repeat all those comp complications. <clears throat> reference orders, you could probably get away with too, depending on what the reference is. Obviously in our order, in our industry, if you're not as familiar, there's, you know, you have your standard new orders, you have repeat orders, which are exact repeat orders. And a lot of times this concept of referencing, which is a lot of times references other art files. So, there's that. Um, I think a lot of times when we sell the concept of purchase orders, there's the, one of the reasons I push for simple orders when people can't handle the configuration is 
get me half of the way there, right? Let me populate my header information. If you can get a product right with a part, meaning that I know the color and size combination, I can then now allocate inventory from your simple purchase order. Uh, a lot of times what we'll see on the people who implement simple purchase orders is they'll get me enough to where I can hold their spot and then they'll email over an art file. And from that art file, there's enough information buried into there. Now, obviously this is not ideal, but I think it's kind of the stepping stone to get to fully configured purchase order. So, you know, there's a very uh, relevant use case there, but obviously the blank on decorated goods is kind of a big deal in this industry, especially right now. Uh, all right. So we're gonna kind of roll through this diagram throughout our session here. Uh, the concept is back to those five initial elements, the PO, the big blue ovals you see there. So there's the PO, the line item, the configuration, the locations and the artwork. So I took, look, I'm not going to read the documentation to you. You all can go on to promocenters.org, log in, download the documentation. We'll post a link to it in the Slack channel afterwards. I don't wanna bore you with that. What I wanna do is kind of break this down into visual elements, show you real life examples of POs that people are sending and processing today, right? The, one of the largest firms that initially conquered the configured purchase order, the first one was Staples, right? Staples sent amazing configured purchase orders. And then, so you're gonna see examples from Staples, you're gonna see some common skew examples, and you're gonna see some, um, any promo examples. These, I want to show you the, these things happening in the wild so that you not think that this is just some sort of uh, lab experiment of what could happen uh, if everything went right. <clears throat> so we're gonna go through each of these elements, kind of break them down show the examples and we'll walk through this tree. But at the end of the day, we have a PO, POs have line items, line items can have configurations, right? That PO line item or that line item configuration breakdown is where the cutoff is between simple and configured. Oddly enough, the configured purchase order, the, per the parent element of it is called configuration. Go figure. So then configurations have charges. Uh, configurations are made up of locations, which in the promo standard world, locations have decorations, not the other way around. And then in the day, locations and decorations have artwork that has a lot of properties. So this visual is what we're going to traverse through and show real world examples as we go. So let's, uh, let's start this party. <clears throat> so up here, this main parent element um, off of the PO, right? We have what's called shipments. So, and I'll try to explain some of the rationale as we go through of why things are located where they're at. I think there's a debate that a lot of this stuff could be puked down into the line item details, but I think a lot of it comes down to the reusability uh, and consistency across pro standard services. So <clears throat> the, one of the main elements off of our purchase order is shipments. The shipment, uh, as you can see over there, so I. As we go through, I use my old Notepad++ trusty editor, and this way it will allow us to kind of refer to some line numbers, especially if you're following along on a recording uh, after the fact. But from line 41 there, the shipment array all the way down to the bottom, there's really two main elements there, right? There's the concept of the, the, the shipment itself, right, which is What's the account information? If you're gonna ship a third party, here's all the details. So here's all the you know, staples, third party shipping information, great. Um, there's a lot of properties that go along through there. You know, is it a blind ship? Is it a, can we uh, consolidate the shipment? The freight details which are in there, one of the things that I know the standards committee took up as a actionable thing to correct is the you know, creating standard carrier list Promo standards is always kind of, we've been very cautious of using the existing list that is, you know, the NMFC list or <clears throat> proprietary list. So I think we are going to finally try to standardize what we're calling carriers and methods and service levels. Uh, but at the end of the day, so we have the shipment array, which is what's my shipping information, AKA my third party information, any properties that are in there, how's the shipping, what carrier, what service. And then most importantly, it's a ship to. So one of the things that you're going to see is, and we're going to, one of the last slides, we're going to dive into this. The PO service is littered with these linking and group IDs, right? You'll see uh, down on line 78 there, the shipment ID. 
So this is very important because every ship two locations, I can have multiple ship two locations because I can have multiple shipments in the shipment array. I can put 12 ship two locations up there, then reference my line items or in my part ID, my part groups, which lines are going to which addresses and what quantities. So the concept here is to define all of your ship twos up at the PO level, as far as the addresses, knowing that I can then reuse this. So I might have two line items that are going to ship to the same address over and over. So why would I duplicate that ship two down at the line item detail? So back to that, you know, uh, reusability concept, we've put this shipment information up there using the shipment ID is how to reference this product goes to this address. So you'll see examples of that um, along the way. One of the other pieces that we get a lot of questions on is <clears throat> this contact concept. So ProSanders has been trying to reuse this contact object in all of our standards, probably starting with PO moving forward. I know Invoice uses it, the new OS 2.0 is using it, the new OSN 2.0 is using it. So we're trying to get back and create these standardized objects. But <clears throat> promo centers in the documentation, the PO documentation lists a bunch of different types of contacts. The biggest one here is what's your bill to information. Now, here's kind of taking a step back from a practical standpoint. I know your credentials. I know your account number when you sent me the order. Now, there is a... The reason that the bill to information is put into the actual spec, which you'd say in theory, it could be left off because I know who you are. Just because you're sending me the PO doesn't always mean that you're sending it on behalf of yourself, right? Uh, for example, take a Performa. Uh, Performa's got the mothership, but they have 600 individual owner locations. So I am going to be processing a purchase order from Performa, but at the same time, they're going to pass, this is where they fill out, hey, this is Albrecht out of Ohio and it's not the mothership um, down, down in Tampa. So this still, you know, the concept of the, you know, bill to information lives here, uh, you, you know, line 13, you read pretty much identify that it's uh, the contact type is bill. Now here's where it gets all over the place. A lot of, depending on the company, they determine which other contact types are relevant. And I see it basically order to order. So Staples is awesome about providing the expediter, right? If something goes south on this order, here's what you do it. This is essentially what happens on that piece of paper, that email that you get, that fax that you used to get 20 years ago, and now it's just a million emails. That same essential information of here's all the contacts, here's how you get a hold of them if something goes south. So that's cool. Uh, another one, back to the reusability, we put the proof, the what is formerly known as paper proof in our industry. Right, is now rebranding, hopefully, as an industry to digital proofs. Um, this information lives up at the header level. I think you, that's pretty common on purchase orders to not see the digital proof living at the line item. But what we allow here is back, and I'm going to define these line item grouping things at the end, is there is that link of this line item or a group of line items gets, you know, send this digital proof here and obviously there's different types you can send it via email like you can send it you know fax it's just a whole host of different types but i would say 99 percent of every digital proof i've ever seen filled out was email so that's that one question and i think this is a we had to support it and i rarely see it get used in the wild as tax information where i see this being used the most is in canada um i sit three miles from the, well, I can't even that, probably a mile from the border between US and Canada. In Canada, a lot, most purchase orders come over with a uh, PST number. They have to, on their purchase orders, uh, put their tax identification number on there. Allows for preferential tax treatments. That is really in that tax ID where we see the most use. Not to be, not to sound bad about it. I don't trust anybody else enough to calculate taxes on my behalf. Um, if you sent me a tax amount, I'd probably look at it, but then I'd calculate the tax amount myself based on where it's shipping to and all that other stuff. But I do think there is, you see on a standard purchase order, the tax information, you know, that, hey, this is a tax exempt order. Here's the, here's the type of tax. And you know, I think we have to support that and that tax jurisdiction is where a lot of that goes into. But um, like I said, there's the implications of how much do you trust somebody else to calculate your taxes on your behalf? So 
Good luck. All right, let's uh let's, let's hop into this thing here. So the next group we want to talk about is you know the whole line up. So we're still in simple world, right? If somebody has to send me a simple PO, you know, I still need this information. So we're gonna dive into the offshoots of the line item here in our purchase order. Okay, tolerance details. Big thing in the industry, I would say majority of configured purchase orders are coming over with uh, tolerance of exact only. So it's that concept of overruns, underruns. Um, I would say the people who are doing configured or electronic purchase orders aren't always the ones who are going to accept and be okay with overs. Uh, but this, that whole tolerance is essentially, can I send you overs? How many, if not exact only, makes the whole thing easy. But this is very common in our industry. This is why I think it's important that our standards were to collaboratively develop within our industry. If I sent this to, when I place an Amazon order, I don't say, hey, it's okay if you ship me that extra 5% extra TVs, right? Or you can undership my by 5%, that's cool, right? These, this is a printing world thing. Obviously paper, this is, you know, really proliferates out of the paper industry, but it's the it's nature of the beast. So that's that, I digress. Program, right? This is another element and you see here on uh, line 99 and 100, our industry loves programs. And the key for this is back to the repeat reference. I can do a lot with an order if I know it's part of a program. In our world, what I mean by program is I already have the art on file. I already have some sort of predetermined pricing structure, decoration structure for this program. So I might have this backpack that lives in this program. And this is you know how I roll. Um, I ch changed all the prices and everything for all these. So anybody who's trying to get crafty and you know think there's any proprietary information in here, it's just a bunch of garbage data. So <clears throat> having said that, so that's where the program piece lives in. Now, this is important because I think we get a lot of varying opinions here, but I've talked to the largest suppliers who are processing purchase orders today. Even if you send me a simple purchase order, I have to have a part ID. Why is that? Notice nowhere in the line item detail is there a field called color name. Why? Because it's implied by the part ID. If you look at the product data and any service we've done, we have that whole product part relationship. The size and color information live at the part ID. It does not live at the product level. So in order to send Alpha Broder a yellow small t-shirt order, you have to send them a part ID. Same thing with Samar. If you're going to send them a Gildan extra large white shirt, you have to pass a part ID that's valid because how else are they gonna know size, color, product, part ID. So just know that. Um, I think it's an important piece that, you know, I like, now, yes. So, uh, probably the Raj or Eric, if they're listening to this, you can puke a lot of stuff up into the line item description. That's cool. So if you give me a, this bag here comes in black and it comes in I mean, white, right? You could say, hey, in the description, uh, I want the black ones, not the white ones. That's great, but humans are gonna have to read this and it's not going to have the same allocation of inventory. And I'm, it's probably gonna generate a phone call because you know it's so, Part IDs, past part IDs and simple POs makes everybody's life easier. I can get so much done if you just give me that part ID. I can allocate inventory, hold your spot in line. If you have a program, I can reference your old program. Please just figure out what the base level SKU information is and give me that part ID. All right, so within the part, the part is where we then obviously describe quantity details, um, you're probably also wondering why is there a quantity at the product level, the line item level and the part level? Um, because a part, a product can have multiple parts, right? A lot of that is, you know, if I have a yellow bag or in a blue bag, the question I get a lot is, do you want multiple parts underneath one line? If you're going to order a yellow bag and a blue bag, I would prefer you put it on two separate line items and have one part per line item. Now, technically, the way the standard's written and the way people implement it, you can put them both as individual parts underneath the same line. I would say in our industry, you don't 
traditionally see that like in a standard PO, right? People are line one, yellow bag, line two, blue bag. Don't try to get cute and say line one, 20 yellow, 20 blue. You can certainly do it. Standard supports it. I just think the implementations of how people are adopting this, it'll just cause a slightly a little bit more headache. So that's that. Um, this little orange uh, circle off to the left, that's that shipment link ID, right? Remember, and I'm gonna hit on this again as we go. This tells me that at the end of the day, these 20 bags that are black and they have no size because I know that from my third part ID are going to the ship to address that was listed back on the, the when we're talking about the shipment link information. So these call them, you know, those pointers exist all throughout the PO uh, spec. And this is how we refer specific line items to ship to locations. Poof. All right, let's keep going. All right, the part everybody's been waiting for, configuration details. Yay, super exciting. All right, so this is the probably the line of where I would say, up until now, all this stuff, we'll call that simple. And not as in like, hey, this is easy, anybody can do it simple, just as in unconfigured simple. So configurations location. This is the meat and potatoes of the promo industry, unless you're fortunate enough to only sell blanks and not decorate anything and your life is very simple. Um, but if you don't work at Sandbar, SNS, and Elf Broder, and join the rest of our, our journeys through configuration. Uh, now, what they do is complicated. I don't have 13 more houses. So, configuration, locations. All right, let's do this. So, we have in our world, back to the overall structure, configurations have locations, locations have methods, right? So, and then somewhere in there, we've puked this concept of the charges. Our industry loves these auxiliary charges. This is kind of how we do business. This is a very industry uh, heavy model of these additional charges, call them your setups and your running charges. So I have two examples over here on the right. And I, uh, as you can see with the Milo Plus and Biosigns, I've collapsed most everything. I just wanna give you the overall structure and then we're gonna kind of dive into this. Um, essentially the way this works, as you can see up there on line 8118, there's a configurations object which has locations in it. And then there's some auxiliary information. So this top one up here is where a lot of the reference number uh, information comes into. So our industry is heavily, heavy on referencing other past orders, right? This is to ensure that the next time I print this Coca-Cola mug, it's gonna look exactly like it did the first time I printed it, right? That's very common. You see this, you know, I would say, over a third of orders in our industry are repeated to some degree. So we have to support that. So that's where that auxiliary information comes in at 163, 165. Like I said, I'm not reading the documentation to you. I don't want to insult your intelligence. You often read the documentation. This is just to try to show you in the wild what's happening out there. So we have configurations. Configurations have a bunch of locations, one or many locations. Let's go. So, <clears throat> um, off to the offshoot, this green bubble off to the right, we have charges. So charges are interesting. Uh, and we're about to start getting into the elements of where are you need to start referring to PPC, right? The definition of configured order is that you're using the supplier's product price configuration information. So that's an important step, but I would argue that Many suppliers will be slightly lax with that. For example, the, the, I have two examples here. The first, the top example is not using my PPC data. And the bottom example is using my PPC data. So on the top example, this is a run charge and a setup charge that are referencing some random charge ID that isn't mine. But this distributor is kind enough that every time that they put blast through a run charge, they call the charge name, run. And every time they do a setup charge, the charge name is setup. As a supplier, I then map all the values back to my system. So this is kind of a, you know, it's important, yes, there's the truth of what the standard should be. Standard should be do what they're doing down here on the bottom, reference my line 113 charge ID, which tells me, hey, I can ignore all this other stuff that's in here other than the quantity because I know that's my charge ID. I know what my price is. 
I know what my name is. I know if I take the quantity, I can insert this into my system. But if you consistently give me the same charge name, I can then say when distributor X sends me a charge that says setup, it maps to this value. Not ideal. I get it. But look, it's, you know, doing the stuff is not perfect. So like I said, a configuration can have multiple charges. Charges can either be obviously in our industry, run charges means that, you know, it's more of a one per product. The setup charge is more of that order level charge, which is one per order, or in this case, one per line item. So this just kind of shows some examples of what these things look like in the wild. I get a lot of questions of, do I need to put this in there? <clears throat> we tend to also address the questions of, what if it's something is free or included in the price? So for example, whoever this distributor is up top, they implicitly are saying, hey, on this product, the first run charge is included. I'm going to pass you a run charge acknowledging that the unit price is zero. Now, obviously in the, on the second charge there, you see it's a $44 charge. You know, it's, you know, that's the difference. It's multiplied one, one times 44 is 44, zero times 22 is zero. So that's that and we digress. Um, so like I said earlier, we have this concept of locations and decorations. All right, some important pieces here. This, while this looks very simple, this is the essence of where the PPC data comes into play. Um, at the end of the day, if I want to automatically process a purchase order, I need to have my location, my decoration, and my part. From that, and give me some quantities along the way, I can do a lot of damage with your purchase order getting it into my system. So <clears throat> location, is my location from my PPC service, right? That's my front pocket of whatever this bag is. Now, if you look down at line 147, location ID 15, that's my internal ID for my uh, front pocket location. Great, this distributor was nice enough to give me my own ID. I technically don't even need the location name because that's my ID. Now, I don't trust any data coming in, so I verify that they both match, but that's just me. And then the same thing, that location, the next concept is, on this front pocket, what of the 47 methods we offer are you going to actually put onto this product? So in this one, we have this four color process um, with decoration idea 20, true color, front pocket, poof, we're off to the races. Location link ID, that's gonna come back and we're gonna talk about that. But look, I, I think a lot of people when they go to implement purchase orders, they wanna tackle the, I wanna do 47 line items to 47 different locations. I wanna do, you know, three products on one PO with all these different things. That's cool. And that's about 5% of the industry. Let's focus on, I have product that has some, probably some color options. We're going to print one or two locations on this product. And we're going to do these methods. We don't have to try to solve the 5%. Let's, let's focus on the 95% up front. So this is how simple it looks when I'm passing along the config, the configuration of the locations here. All right, so let's keep going and we're gonna wrap all this back up into itself. The last piece, back to what makes us unique is every time I do something, I have to have some instructions on what I'm doing. We obviously know the method and where I'm putting it, right? We did all that fun stuff and we know how much I'm charging for it because we touched on all the charges, that's cool. Now let's get to the artwork piece. So, you know, as you go through like this, it's fairly simple when you break it down, right? When you do these, you know, bite-sized pieces, you don't stand back and look at a 16 page documentation and wondering, you know, I've just wheels start spinning. <clears throat> so artwork. So at the end of the day, the most simple implementations of the PO spec are essentially just sending a file over. So I have three examples here of how different people are sending files over. And we're gonna kind of talk about different things here. So my top one here, you guys can figure out, you all can figure out the who, you know, based off the file location. Um, it, I get, people will send over non-production ready art, right? What's that? I think what is defined as non-production ready is, just, you know, good luck uh, defining that. But the concept there is, is essentially this, your, this good art on your template that's ready to go right to your production environment. 
So that means a lot to us. Uh, but we're, you know, at the end of the day, artwork has dimensions, layers, types, and information of files. I can get by with just files. Our industry is so catered to a lot of instructions being buried in the files. Um, unless somebody is a million times smarter than anybody I've met, all these art files are still getting processed by humans, right? There's somewhere 9,000 miles away, there's a bunch of people who are cranking through all this art file, trying to interpret the instructions. So this is kind of that step of where we're trying to pass along those instructions from one human through the World Wide Web to another human 9,000 miles away. So that's that. Um, the middle example here is, yes, I would love it if every email that or every art file that came to me was a unique link uh, that referenced some link that I can just go and grab. But in reality, we live in an industry that for 25 years has emailed everything. There's still a large element and the ProScience PO spec supports the concept of emailing art files. So this middle example here is, hey, I got this production ready art. I'm not going, I don't, I might not have the infrastructure to support direct linking to every file because I might store it on some internal SAN, but hey, I emailed it over. So that is, you know, while not the best in the world, this is something we've been dealing with for 20 years. We know how to handle this. So there's processes in place to go grab that. You have your entire PO fully configured, blast into your system, you know, get that human to dig up that art file. Let's go. And then the last one is a more, uh, production ready art file with a unique URL. It has both the file location, the file name, all, all set into there. So let's keep going. Another thing that we see, I think the larger um, players tend to be very specific on the dimensions of the art file and the logo. Um, you know, this is just part of what we do as an industry, right? You want something, you want it configured at exact uh, dimensions back to those art instructions, this is where we're passing along that. So, you know, hey, this logo that you're using, it's a geometry is a rectangle. Don't max out the imprint area because I pass in use max location to false. Uh, use this specific dimension instead. So obviously this logo is probably a real wide logo that's not that tall. Max it out on the width first, and then they very precisely to the thousandth decimal place uh, calculated the height. So good luck with that. Um, let's go. Uh, another example, oh, I didn't move my yellow arrow, fail. Um, we get a lot of questions on layers and the coloring system. This is where you're defining the, co the colors of the logo. Our industry is very heavy on PMS colors. I would say 95 to 99% of every electronic PO I've seen is referencing PMS colors. Yes, you can do RGBs, you can do hex. In the wild, people aren't passing hex orders for hex colors for promo orders. We're still rocking the old PMS color, the Pantone color matching system, right? So this is an example of, I say it's kind of a hybrid hot mess, but here's the beauty, right? Back to the sending art files 9,000 miles away. I would say the majority of suppliers are converting these layers to a human readable format to the person who's configuring the art file. So yes, there's a PMS color system is referenced here. You're probably looking at the second color. It's like, well, what the hell, white? And you put the PMS color for white. Um, well, I think in our world, the concept of standard colors exist and we don't necessarily always have to spell these things out. But when there is a specific example, you know, 1807, it's a very specific color red. This customer obviously cares a lot about that. So this layer section, here is where you define the colors there. I would say the majority of suppliers are regurgitating that into structured instructions for that art file to be processed. Okay, so this bottom blob here is kind of when it's all put together and I have it piecemeal and pulled pieces out over here on the right is essentially what you get, right? All of that stuff that we just went through breaking it out into little pieces while it looks ominous on the left, it's very simple, right? It's 40 lines of XML that says, look, here's, I want this on the top, on the front, uh, top front of this location, do this method, put this art file on it with these dimensions. Oh, by the way, it has to be these specific colors. 
here's your decoration ID information, here's your location ID, poof, we're off to the, the races and running. So all of that to be said, this information here, I have these four line items, this is all from my PPC data. If you give me this information, if you give a supplier this information, this makes this much easier and very easy to process. So my thing is, just be consistent. I will take a decoration name called True Color and you not pass me the decoration ID 20, as long as every time you call it True Color. I think I know a lot of the other suppliers will do the same, but just know the more of these IDs that you can pass from PPC, it makes this whole process a lot easier. All right, let's, uh, let's keep going here. So back, I've been talking a few times about these PO linking mechanisms as we've gone through. There's four main links um, that are pointing line items to shipments, groups, parts, locations, all that fun stuff. Um, I've you know, pulled out of the documentation what they're called, uh, what we've said, but I, these, as we went through, I can just point to it. I'm gonna show some examples here. And essentially, these are to describe the, this stuff ships to this location. This thing is part of this item or I'm going to re-reference and recycle this decoration information on the same part ID. So if I have my blue and yellow bag that we talked about earlier, I can now say this look, this, this decoration information goes to both my yellow bag and my blue bag. So I'm not re repeating and, and duping all that information. So in this configured PO here, what I have, and we talked about this when we went through, my you know, duffel bag that I have here, which, you know, is described on line 70, I have been, that has been assigned line item grouping one. So if there was six other line items on here, they could still be line item grouping one, but this is where they tell me, hey, all of these line items get proofed to this Chris to be up here because line item ID one goes to line item grouping ID one here. So back to the, in the wild, this is how I take a line item or multiple line items and identify what proof location, who gets what proofs. Look, in the wild, 99% of these are one person getting the proof. The cop, you know, it's very rare that you'll see send X person this line item, this person this line item. But at the end of the day, the standard has to support that because you know there's that 1%. Um, the other shipment link example that you know we run into a lot is we define a ship to location so this whatever uh orla park illinois the shipment id one well down here in the parts array there's a shipment id of one this is back to the thing i now know to take 20 pieces of this bg349 bag and look for the shipment up here which is shipment id one now i know that joe madden gets 20 of these bags. Now, if there was a, you know, number two down there, I would know this person gets this quantity of bags. So this is that whole concept of explaining who gets what and how many of what. That's where these linking IDs come to. Like I said, you can go back and, you know, it's all, it's spelled out pretty clearly in the documentation. Uh, I run into this a lot. Uh, math is hard. Multiplying and addition, apparently it's a lot more difficult than we would think. Um, just some of my two cents on this. Well, I say doing PO math, and I'm going to explain some of this over here on the right. At the end of the day, you the most important thing is to put your price and quantities down there. Yes, uh, you can do all the extended pricing math you want. I'm probably going to run that back through in my system on the way in and not trust that you're going to multiply 999 times 10 and get 99.99 and just let me you know figure it out myself. So essentially, the, I would say every single person I've ever onboarded has always been like, well, what plus what equals this number? So I did the math over here. Uh, basically, there's a bunch of totals. There's the PO total amount. At the end of the day, you should get that one right, right? Because what, what I do and what I think a lot of suppliers do is you have done a lot of line item math down below. But if your line item math and my line item math both both match that total, PO total amount, I'm gonna let that thing fly through without a lot of extra scrutiny. Now, if you multiply your sum of your parts times your sum of your charges and all everything in between 
and you get a different PO total than I get, I'm going to have to throw that out and have a, you know, somebody look at this and figure out where the, the discrepancy is. So each one of these you can go through. I, these are the four main areas of PO math that comes into place. And just be careful as you're rolling it up that you're, you know, when you get to the line item totals, make sure you're including your charges. So you're taking your, some of your charges and some of your part extended prices, adding those two together, that's your line item total. Now, essentially, at the end of the day, your line item total summed together should equal your PO total amount. But I get it. Some things don't always work out that way. But let's say, make, make sure you're doing your addition and everything adds up at the end of the day. All right. Um, this is a little next to the last slide here. So going <clears throat> pretty good on time. So here's my tips. And one thing I know the best practices committee, which is run by Aaron Anderson and Alpha. Uh, they're doing some excellent work over there. I know they're going to be diving into the best practices of PO, but I want to kind of give you a thousand foot overview of the breakdown of the standard. So my, I guess, personal implementation tips from doing this for three years, use PPC as much as possible. If, like I said, if you get products right, part IDs right, location IDs, method IDs, and charge IDs, this stuff is simple, right? I see that's getting those five things right isn't always as um, you know simple as I make it. But look, even if you can get the first two, we have a great order. If you can now get my, the locations and methods, still my order just got amazing and I don't have to touch it. And then if you can actually match up my charge IDs so I can verify pricing on the way in, awesome, right? So like I said, Configured purchase orders were made to use PPC product price configuration data. Okay. Uh, like I said earlier, starting simple isn't so simple. Uh, everybody's like, all right, I'm just going to puke over all this information into the line item description and we're good, right? Because I, I, I got the header information in. Well, that's great. But once people realize, oh crap, I have to send an art file. Well, that art file is buried underneath the part configuration decoration location element. So I have to kind of fill out a bunch of stuff along the way to be able to send an art file. Well, if you've done that much work, you might as well just structure out your data as you're going through. Now we have an essentially a configured purchase order. If you can get it to use PPPC, we have an awesome purchase order. Um, like I said, I, as we walk through the example, you can cheat, you can cheat configured by using consistent uh, namings with methods, locations, and charges. Look, suppliers want good purchase orders. They will work with you, work with people. If you're a supplier, look, just, just map the values. Um, I think there's some, as long as people are consistent, we can handle consistent, right? Even if you call it whatever the heck you want to call it, just call it the same thing every time and I'm going to map it and blast it in my system in a consistent way. Uh, suppliers, if you're out there, put together some onboarding guides. Don't just send over a 16 page document you know, if there's certain things that you have to have, if you need, you know, look, Alpha Broder needs a part ID. Sandmar needs a part ID, right? Don't just assume that everybody is going to know that this is what you need to send over a purchase order. So look, don't just, you know, hope for the best. If you really want to get purchase orders going in your system, put together some documentations for how you as supplier, <laughs> what you need to do to process business. Uh, I'd like to thank my Canadian friends and make the best coffee in the world, Tim Hortons. So, anyway. Uh, lastly, on there, distributors and service providers. Um, like I said, don't try to solve for the four line items, two locations, drop shipping to everybody. That's, that's a lofty goal. And yes, we, you're going to eventually have to get there. Solve the single line, single location, single color order first. Then, Say, all right, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to ship it to two locations, or I'm going to add a second line item. That stuff's cool, but get to that iterative process. And if you try to solve the fully configured world first, your head's going to explode. Um, so that's my two cents. We have six minutes left. Real quick, um, next month, we're going to take everything I just told you, throw it out the window, and try to jam configured purchase orders with product data 2.0. So that's real neat that I stacked them up that way. Then you can all read and see what kind of what the education sessions are. Third Tuesday, every month, I'm going to stop sharing here. We're going to hit some Q and A, uh, and wrap this rhino up here for the next few minutes. 
Is there a difference between built to and sold to? Uh, Eric Lesser's typing, it looks like. So in most cases, I would say no. Back to my performa uh, example, let's say they had a bill to that was the mothership, right? Um, you know, as you see that a lot in our industry is people processing purchase orders on behalf of somebody else. So let's say the bill to might be perform a mothership, but at the end of the day, they probably transacted that order on behalf of one of their affiliate companies. So the sold to could very well be perform Albrecht out of Ohio. That's how we allow for that discrepancy of call it, or not discrepancy, a mothership processing orders on behalf of somebody else. So that would be a use case there. Um, yeah, another way to talk about it, John, is sold to is who's placing the order and bill to is who should receive the invoice. There you go. That's uh, and, and 50 less words. That's a, just a good answer. Um, All right, anonymous attendee in the house. That's a good question. How do I pr pass additional options in a purchase order? For example, oh, I gotta get out of this screen here. Uh, for example, ink colors for pens. Okay, it, two two questions or two things. If that was a configured, I would hope that in their PPPC status, they direct linked to a configuration. Um, for example. I would say that if let's say we're taking Koozie Group, who makes the you know a thousand variations with the click stick, hopefully they have a part ID over in PPPC that references the purple pen with blue ink, uh, with a, a yellow cap. So the easy way is let's use PPPC. If not, then you could probably use, you know utilize some of the descriptions fields down at the part level. Now there is, and I know Steve brought this up a little while ago. Because, no, I intentionally did not go down the path today of the straw cup with 47 different options. I think the if we start to get into the 5%, our heads would explode and there's enough to cover it there. But in the, I'm trying to find it as I look at the documentation here, there is the, Where's the part group? Um, there is a configuration grouping um, that handles that. I'll get back to you. I'll, I'll answer that one in Slack. That's a great question. Uh, freight details, carrier service, both required. How should we know what to put in there? Great question. Um, whatever you put in there, just make it consistent. So. Um, let's say FedEx, look, the, the three biggest ones, FedEx, UPS, Pure Later, USPS, I guess that's four, not three. Um, you know, I would say FedEx is one word, UPS, don't type out Federal Express. You can if you want, don't type out United States Postal Service. Um, but as a supplier, as long as every time you send me an order that for FedEx, it says FedEx, that one word, that's cool, I'll map that. If you send me Fed-X, the Federal Space Express, and every time it's something different, I'm gonna have a problem with that. Now, you know, the second side of it should be, you know, FedEx ground, right? So I would say, what, 90%, 90% of all industry orders are shipping FedEx ground, UPS ground, USPS, or pure later ground. We've just solved 90% of the world's problems with four scenarios. So. Get those right and consistent. Yes, promo standards very much needs to publish a list of carriers and carrier preferred names. Aaron, if you're listening on the BPC, maybe that's something you guys can at least plug in the interim uh, for a best practice. I like that. So Should just supplier... to follow up on that, John, Go ahead. very quickly. Yeah. There is something called the standard carrier alpha code. It is not a public standard, but it's widely used in the shipping industry with carriers. And you can find that on Wikipedia. So if you just look up the SCAC or the standard carrier alpha code, you're going to see the FedEx, UPS, and 142 others are listed there. That's a good practice. And then you'll see what John is talking about kicking in using whatever they map on their side. And then lastly, I know uh, that's a great question. Should, should the supplier not provide that list? 
Yes. Um, ultimately, the supplier is going to need to communicate, and I know the standards committee is working on a service to help communicate this, um, that just because USPS is a thing doesn't necessarily mean that I offer it. Um, Pure Later Ground's a cool service, but not everybody ships in Canada and offers it. So part of, remember that onboarding spec that I referenced on one of the last slides, there has to be some communication of, you know, these are the things I do. These are my FOB locations. These are my shipping methods that I, I use. These are, you know, the specific things that I have to have a process of purchase order. Somebody might want terms on the purchase order. I personally don't care, but I'm just some very large entities in this industry who very much want you to fill out the terms of the purchase order. Um, so that's a great question. Um, all right, we are one minute over, so we're going to pause this party. Uh, if you want to continue this conversation over in the Slack, uh, we can certainly do that. I, I'll, I'll chime in for a little bit here. If you have any questions, if you're sending this as a recording, you have questions, hit me up. We have a standards committee that uh, is living and breathing this stuff all the time. Also hit up Jessica if you have any additional questions. She can point you in the right direction as well. Like she does nothing but, you know, try to herd the cats and run this organization and, and keep you know the lights on. She's doing an excellent job there. So hit her up. Great, probably number one resource in promo standards today is hitting up the admin. All right. Peace out, everybody. Good time. See you next month. Go register for the tech summit. It's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be premier industry event of the year. Guaranteed. Do it.